Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Naveen Agarwal. This video is a recording of an interactive Q&A session we just had very recently on the topic of risk management for medical devices. Now risk management continues to be a challenging topic even for those of us who have been in the industry for many many years. So the intent behind these interactive Q&As is to engage in a conversation, in a dialogue. And sure enough, we had a very engaging conversation about certain topics related to risk management. And this is not going to be the only Q&A session. We will have more in the future. So you can watch the entire video at leisure. It's about an hour long. Or you can follow the timestamped links as part of this video to scroll forward to a question of interest. So I want to invite you to take a look at it and I hope you will enjoy and learn something new. If there are more questions, please let me know and I look forward to meeting you again on our future interactive Q&As. So let's start uh, with a few submitted questions. So the first question was, how would you explain the return on investment in risk management activities to a CEO or a CFO beyond just meeting the regulatory requirements? How does risk management help a business grow and mature? This is a very relevant question and wonderful question to discuss. And um, here is what I will say. You know, if you look at just the regulatory view, it gives you a way to demonstrate safe and effective product. And I say that it gets you to the starting line. So I'm a runner, so I'll use a little bit of examples from running. It gets you to the starting line. But let's talk about this. Uh, Boston Marathon, you know, the, the, the top quality race. Everybody wants to run in that race. Uh, let's look at their qualifying times over the last, let's say, 40, 50 years here. We're going back to 1970s. You can see that the qualifying times have come down, right? They started with about four hours. Now they're about three hours. So just to play, you have to be at a certain level. Okay. But to win, it's a totally different story. That's around two hours consistently. And we are trying to break the two hour barrier. So the bottom line is this, that we want to use the, the risk management as a competitive advantage. And again, these are some of the points I want to discuss with you that you can share with your executive leadership and help them understand why risk management is important. First, speed to market. I believe it can shorter, shorten your development cycles. Okay. You have done a rigorous risk analysis in your design and development process. You have taken care of all the different safety issues, concerns. You have applied different controls. You have done things right at first. And by doing that, you can also shorten your regulatory approval clearance cycle. And think about in dollar terms. I'm sure you can calculate very quickly the dollar sales that can be affected or incremental sales you can get by a reduction of about a week in regulatory approval clearance time frame. So that you can put very easily in terms of numbers. Stakeholder trust. You will have fewer post-market adverse events, recalls, increased trust with patients, physicians and payers. This is becoming very important. Your brand matters. So if you can do it right, you have stakeholder trust. Cost of compliance. Reduced likelihood of surprise inspections, faster, easier updates to systems and records, and lower cost of compliance. We talk about cost of compliance a lot. It is not less important, but I like to talk about it a little bit later when I talk to executives. I talk about the upside first, the potential for growth first, and then I talk about cost. We present both stories at the same time. It's just a matter of timing. The second question was also very interesting. Which type of risk analysis technique do you recommend to your clients and uh, why? <clears throat> Hazard analysis format versus FMEA. So let's discuss that first. I don't see this as an either or. I recommend both hazard analysis and FMEA or some other risk analysis tools. These are not mutually exclusive. They serve different purposes. Hazard analysis to me is at a higher level uh, evaluation or assessment, understanding of hazards, hazardous situations and harms. And you can use a preliminary hazard analysis tool for that purpose. FMEA, on the other hand, is a, what I call engineering risk analysis tool. So you, you will look at failure modes, you will look at their potential causes, 
you look at their potential effects and you will implement controls to control and manage those failure modes. Keep in mind that the device doesn't need to fail for a safety event to happen in practice. And that's exactly why both tools are important. You need to find a way to connect them, link them appropriately. And we can talk about that a little bit more in our discussion, but I've helped many clients do that. Uh, are there any best practices on recommendations on how to use risk information to determine appropriate residual risk disclosures? And this is becoming important in the context of ISO 14971, 2019 and EU MDR requirements. So disclosure of significant residual risk, what is significant, right? You may take the approach that all high severity risks of harm may be significant. And of course you have controlled them to the level that is mandated by your risk acceptability criteria, but they are significant. So you may want to disclose them. Uh, there is no specific clear guidance on this. There is, um, there is no specific clear guidance on this. Uh, it depends upon what you believe is significant. I would say, write it out, make the criteria, write it out so people understand. Severity is one consideration. Other consideration is potential for misuse, where you believe there might be a lot of potential misuse that includes both use errors and abnormal use. You must consider how to appropriately disclose and what you want to tell your users so that those misuses are appropriately managed. So there is no specific clear description of what is significant. It is up to us to decide. And those are two examples that I wanted to share with you. Okay, there's a question here, difference between FMEA and PHA. So we talked about that. PHA is preliminary hazard analysis. It primarily focuses on hazards, hazardous situations and harms. It's at a much higher level. FMEA I consider to be at an at a underlying level. It's a hierarchical relationship in my mind because FMEA considers failure modes and faults. How and why and in what ways a device can fail. So that's more of an engineering consideration. PHA is at a higher level. Hazards can be presented whether the device fails or not. So that is a primary difference to understand. And when we try to do both in one instrument, such as FMEA, we have a problem. We find it very difficult. And that's what I've seen in my experience. Could you please repeat it? I'm sorry, I could not hear you before. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, great, perfect. <laughs> okay, so my question is exactly related to what you just stated. I am working with a client that has a very simple product. It's um, a common commercial product. It's slightly modified. It's a class two, although you would probably be surprised um, because you'd think that it would probably be a class one, but, um, and I can't really tell you more about it, but it's, sure. it's only two components. Um, <clears throat> and so what I'm looking for is a very, I mean, very simple manufacturing, two components. There, it's a, a, the use case is, it's not even a physician, it's the, the customer is a, you know, um, is the patient. So um, almost like a bandage type situation. So I'm looking for, uh, I'm really used to exactly what you've said before, using a PHA at a high level, using the um, three FAMIAs. But this even seems way overkill for this simple product. Is there a simple, I've always worked on class two and class three devices. I'm looking for a simple tool for a product that maybe has two or three manufacturing steps, two or three components, a simple use scenario. And I tried combining the PHA and the FAMIA and I'm like, oh my God, this is like making it more hard. So do you have any recommendations on yeah. a, a tool? So here's what I would say is um, simplicity will come from how you link the device failures with hazards, hazardous situations and harms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Simplicity is not necessarily whether you use PHA or FMEA, mm -hmm. but how you actually figure out what leads to sequence of events, hazardous situations and harms. Okay. If you can do it in one tool in one place, nobody's saying we cannot do that or we should not okay. do that. Okay. Because I, I, th I think basically that just a um, hazard analysis is going to be fine because you don't have to think too yeah. deeply about it. And it so, is. so, okay. And so you haven't seen any issues where um, the agency would be like, oh, you have to do more than a hazards analysis. Well, so let's take a step back. Agency is going to go with your procedures mm -hmm. and methods. Okay. They, are, they are going to mandate what the regulatory requirements need or not, notify. They are not going to tell you how to do something. Right. So you need to figure out 
what they are looking for is how you control the risk of harm, how you mm-hmm. estimate mm-hmm. the risk mm-hmm. of harm, how mm-hmm. you figure out what controls you need to put in place, what is your risk acceptability criteria. So I would say read the requirements carefully yeah. and figure out a way to implement in your system based on the complexity. Now, you may be doing one thing today, but keep an eye for the future, right? Let's say in five years from now, your business is going to expand. Can you put some instruments and techniques together that will help you to scale? Yeah, I've already, yeah, so I've read the whole, I've read it several times. <laughs> yep. um, and like I said, I'm really used to um, using software, using FAMIAs, hazard analysis, um, also scaling. This is a startup. It's yep. a one, one trick pony, but I'm keeping it such that the um, procedure keeps it broad, like you can use whatever tool you want, but I'm basically like in the, I'm in the weeds now yep. and I'm so, like, all right, this is not linking. Maybe I have to keep it as a, but I'm only used to using use and, and um, process and design for me a linked to hazard analysis, but it's, you know, three separate sheets on Excel spreadsheet. I'm like, it just seems like overkill. It, so again, it doesn't have to be one way or other. Let's keep the big picture in mind. What are we trying to do? <laughs> create safe and effective products. Yes. They don't control risks in an ongoing way. Yeah. Understand the practice of your people. Mm-hmm. Understand where there is a gap with requirements and fix that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I try not to force too many tools and instruments on mm-hmm. my clients because right. I need to understand what they do first mm-hmm. and design a system around it. People are not doing things, wrong things on purpose. Oh, right. Yeah. No, I mean, these are people that aren't, they're new to med device. So yep. I, that's, what, that's why I want it to be simple because otherwise yep. it's too okay. hard. So I'm thinking, I'm kind of thinking of just a hazard analysis. Um, I say no, no harm. In fact, okay. the same, you can use the same instrument to reflect all the, include all the controls you have implemented right. before and after. You can do the yeah. same. Right. Okay. Okay. Let's, Thank you. Let's move on. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your discussion. So I will show uh here my slides again thank you this is exactly what we want question number three in my experience during the risk estimation process before and after risk controls are in place i always see the reduction in the probability of the risk whereas the severity of risk remains same all the time it is understandable in majority of the cases and the harm from the anticipated worst case will not change even after risk controls but I'm curious to know, are there any instances severity of the harm can be reduced after the risk control measures? Okay. So you guys probably might be using this five by five table. I'm not sure, but I put that as a schematic for us to understand. Uh, We know risk has severity. We know probability, right? What I try to do is define the harm in a very precise way. And I use very standardized terms. I use a a resource called MEDRA, which is Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities. Those terms are defined in a medical way. Talk to your doctors and define harms in a very specific, unique way, because my, what I try to do is not to have different severities for the same harm. Severity, if if you feel that what you have done has changed the severity, most likely you have changed the harm. So think about a new term or a different term that more accurately describes that final condition that the patient or the user may likely suffer. Uh, It is very unlikely that you would have reduced the severity of the harm. And I've seen a lot of discussions around that. What happens is that the controls allow you to manage sequence of events and hazardous situations. And you bring the probability of harm potentially down by doing that, not by changing the the severity. Okay, so again, I will... um, Stop my share here because I really want conversations and discussions. Does it make sense? And if anybody wants to kind of jump in, say a few things, you're very welcome to do that. We have a lot of people on this call who have a lot of experience. I don't have all the answers. And I see this as a two-way conversation. Uh, You can also share your conversations in the chat box. So for example, uh, we have a comment. If any standards apply, you use the hazards and risk controls, identify the standards and no other steps are required for the hazards. Identified. See, yeah, so there's a lot of information. TR24, thank you, Bill, for pointing that out. Um, uh, a lot of information in the 24971. Guidance, tips that you can really implement in your system. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate that. Okay. And I also had, um, uh, Naveen, that the FDA doesn't require that you use any specific tools. 
They right. only require that you do risk analysis in the, in the regulation. However, risk analysis is defined in the preamble where it says you need to uh, identify the hazard in both normal and fault condition and uh, uh, evaluate the, the risk and then implement risk controls as required. So that's in, unfortunately, it's not in the regulation, but it does show up in um, indirectly in 13485. So you can uh, you can find some some help there in, in uh, uh, ISO 13485. Good, thank you, thank you, Ed. I see Sarab is requesting to speak. I will. Uh, how do I unmute? You should be able to speak, Sarab. I see your mic is. I, in. Go can ahead. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, what I was going to say was um, the previous question regarding severity. I think the one way you can reduce severity is by designing out. So adding new design control features or um, yes. changing the way the design is. So if the current feature results in a certain harm, if you design it out, you can re remove that harm. But um, or reduce it, but that's probably the only way. Otherwise, it's usually occurrence that gets reduced. Yep, that's a good point. And even if you feel you have designed it out, I think it is very hard to prove that the probability is zero. Yes, if and it introduces right. new harms. So what you could say, hey, um, by designing it out, we are lowering the probability to a very low level, but because of these design considerations, maybe there are some other hazardous situations and harms that can happen, okay? So you can add a line item to your preliminary hazard analysis as you do development, and as you update POH, you can add new items based on the new understanding. You will never eliminate risk. You will never eliminate all the harms. You will update them, okay? So unless you can conclusively say there is no way a specific harm can happen and that's why I'm gonna remove it from the PHA. Sure, you can do that, but it's very unlikely in my opinion. That, so that's what I was saying. If you design it out such that a way that you absolutely avoid from that occurring, right? Like say for example, you're um, in making an incision in the wound and you need to avoid a certain um, vascular um, access there and you okay. block it completely. So you are, you are changing the, you're changing the procedure itself. You are changing how it yeah. is. Okay. Right. Then, then pay attention, pay attention to the intended use, pay attention to the reasonably right. foreseeable misuses. Uh, you may start with a PHA and end up in a different place, but make sure you have a clear traceability of what you have done through the design process. Correct. Yeah, I found, um, actually that it is possible to exactly what uh, Sarab said is that if you design out a component, like I've done that myself where you have a sharp or you have um, a seam or something. And if you're able to completely design that out, then you can eliminate, a, you can eliminate a potential, a whole line item because you eliminate a potential yeah. harm. But a lot of times exactly as you said, Naveen, sometimes then you have to think about, okay, with this new design, do I have now a new additional risk? So okay. you have to always be thinking about that. I think we have a very good comment from Ed here. Designing out the hazard does reduce severity. So if you eliminate the hazard, eliminate. you don't have hazardous situations. And now the, the, the thing to think about is really understand what you're doing, what are the potential sequence of events that will lead to hazardous situations. And then you can redefine a new term for the harm that you believe is more, more appropriate. But what I advise people to do is really be very precise in a definition of the harm, very precise. So, um, and use that dictionary because that's kind of medically oriented. And, and this is a decision that should be made by a medical professional when it comes to harm, not necessarily by engineers. That's how I feel, okay? In All right, so let's go back. We have a few more good questions that came back uh, that I posted. Yes, sir. Uh, it does help, and you just brought up a very important point, to have your severities of harm uh, and, and, and the resulting harm identified by medical professionals, not by engineers. Right. Uh, and and uh, the only way you can reduce severity is like we've just discussed, 
is designing out that hazard because you're not going to reduce severity uh, in in most other, I won't be exclusive, I'll always leave a way out, but I've never seen uh, anyone uh, reduce severity um, without designing out the hazard. Yeah, I would say, I think what, be, well, what engineers think, and I'm an engineer, so, and so are a lot of people on this call, is if I had done all I could, it's very, I think they're thinking likelihood. They're not really thinking severity and they're thinking something else will happen which is not as bad. What I say to that, figure out what something else is. They give it a term and put it in your harm severity table, include that in your master table, that now I think this is more likely to happen and this is the new severity for that particular harm. Does that make sense? So we need to work very, very closely with, with medical professionals and make this as a standard harm severity table for your organization. Uh, any changes to that should go through a pretty rigorous review in my opinion, okay? The other aspect that you just brought up there, Naveen, is that a single hazard uh, through a hazardous situation can lead to multiple types of harm. That's right. You have to explore all of those. You That's right. Just explore the, the most severe or what, but each of those needs to be explored. And the point you made, Ed, is that if you eliminate the hazard, let's say you don't use electrical power at all. You eliminate a lot of hazards. That means you will eliminate all the associated harms that you have identified with that hazard, hazardous situation harms. Okay, uh, Sanoj, uh, interesting discussion. So where in fact the risk assessment comes in place during the design process? Everywhere. Risk assessment is estimation of risk and evaluation of risk. Two things. You are trying to figure out what the risks are. You are trying to figure out the quantification, qualitative or semi-quantitative, what they are. And you're trying to figure out, are they acceptable to you or not? That's a whole risk assessment. Okay. So in the beginning, in the beginning, you might be in a situation where you say, I don't know much. And my assessment looks like most of my risks are not acceptable based on my criteria. Then you think about what I, what I can do. Then you do another assessment. See if it's acceptable. I think this is a cycle. If you go through 4971 and the guidance, it's a loop. So you do that loop iteratively through the design process. Maybe a situation that you come across your assessment that it's not, still you have some risks which are beyond your criteria for acceptance. Then you talk about benefit risk and you know, so on and so forth. So answer to your question, Sanoj, is um, everywhere and post-market, continue to do that. It doesn't stop with the design process. And, and I can begins, see you have some comment. And it begins before the design process because ISO 13485 clause 7.3.3C says the outputs of risk management are inputs to design input. That's so right. that means you have to have done at least an initial risk assessment prior to uh, developing your design inputs. Right, perfect, thank you, good point, good point. Great discussion, this is, this is the intent here guys. We, are, we want to talk, this is not a lecture, this is not a presentation, this is a learning experience. So I really appreciate that, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, I think uh, Oh. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I think also the um, the 2019 standard starts with foreseeable misuse to identified. So they, they moved it up front, I think, in, in the cycle. But, but keep in mind, they, yes, but perfection is not expected. You must start and you must learn yes. and you must update. It doesn't mean that you stop everything and try to be perfect before we even do anything. Do the best you can. Learn from Learn from a device which is similar. Learn from a use case which is similar to what you're trying to do. Look at the data which is published publicly. But do not stop progress because, you know, we want to be perfect. So that, that was a little bit of the way I look at it. Do the best you can and acknowledge it is an initial draft and continue to work. In fact, the more progress you show, the better case you will have in telling people that you did your due diligence. The other piece... Just following on to this, Naveen, is the fact that our design process is cyclical and we're going to make design changes during the process, Absolutely. which could uh, introduce new hazards. So uh, risk management is a cyclical process on purpose. And if you look at figure one in the standard and figure B1 uh, in the annex uh, of 14971, you'll see that everything is cyclical and you need to go back 
whenever you learn new information. And that's going to be the whole design process. And let me add to that, Varna, the point you made, keep it simple. Because you're going to be doing it over and over again. If you create 10 different documents, you'll have to change all of them. Do things in a simple way. Yeah. Excellent. So I do have... Uh, the other thing I was going to mention... Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to comment... Yeah, I was just going to comment um, that made me think of... I've seen a lot of um, folks uh, actually not so much behind with risk management, although I see a lot of people saying, when do I have to start? I'm like, well, you have to start early. But... Um, because uh, usability is more recent, um, people still not doing usability, and yet um, FAMIA, use FAMIA, all you know, is so well tied into usability. Um, any comments on that? Uh, so there is, a, if I hear you right, you're talking about usability in terms of some of the usability studies you might do. Is that yeah, six, specifically six two three six six. Okay. So I see a lot of people are uh, still unaware that they have to, that there's a requirement um, okay. under design control to do usability through 62366 and the FDA usability guidance. Yeah, you, you have to. But what I'm going to say, when you start, you, you start with four, reasonably four scenarios. Before you go to do usability work, you need to first think about what are the reasonably foreseeable scenarios, because that will inform your subsequent work and subsequent studies. And remember, design is a trade-off. It's a trade-off between what, what is required, what you can do, and the safety requirements. So you have to constantly make these trade-offs based on an informed analysis of what you believe based on the use case, the reasonably foreseeable misuse scenarios might be. And you kind of, through the design process, you know, start eliminating them one by one so that you are left with something that you now you go want to test. That I would say it's a cyclical process. It's an iterative process and you have to do the best you can up front to articulate what are the potential scenarios that you should be addressing. It's an iterative process. Okay, six, uh, six, I, I got six, more. Six, go six, let me add that, Naveen, because she brought up a very important point, Verna, thank you. Um, 62366 does have in Annex A, a diagram that shows the linkage between risk management yes. and uh, usability engineering, which is the FDA uses the term human factors. It's basically the same thing. Uh, FDA did have input in the development of 62366, both the dash one and the dash two that's now out. So um, FDA expects, and at one point they did have every a uh, product submission reviewed by a human factors engineer. So uh, I don't know if they're still doing that or not, but be aware that you have to do usability at the FDA. Yeah. And to that point, Ed, some of the aspects of reasonably foreseeable misuse are not entirely included in that definition. So you have to be aware of that. You have to do both. Okay, how to apply ISO 14971 in alignment with ICHQ9 in combination products, okay? So combination products is a whole new, different world. They do ICE, in pharma world, they do ICHQ9. So here's my perspective on this. So first, let's take a step back and look at the pharma world. You know, a lot of research, a lot of development, a lot of clinical trials before you get to that starting line, which I talked about starting to run lot more work happens. Safety and effectiveness evidence is collected. Once you get safety and effectiveness, market authorization, I think life cycle is limited because then the, then the principle is do not change. That's why ICHQ9 mostly focus in my mind on quality risk management. Okay, there's a certain difference, but very strong. Look at the device world. We do feasibility, we do development, we go through these quick cycles. We have some limited clinical trial data. We get market authorization. And then life cycle for us is big. Look at this example, 15 generations of implantable defibrillators since 1989. This is the kind of perspective we have to think about for combination products. That combination products, particularly device-led combination products, will have this life cycle element. And that's why 14971 becomes important. So one more slide before I open up to discussion. So very similar processes, very, in my mind, steps are similar, iterated process, a lot of communication, a lot of reviews, uh, but ISO 14971, more formal, okay? 
ICHQ-9 is more of a guidance. 4971 is required if you are going to be demonstrating safety uh, risk management. An emphasis instead of, co so control of process is not excluded from ISO 14971. So I don't want to give you an impression that this emphasis of control of process is not here. But here we are more worried about controlling the hazards and life cycle is an important piece. So I think combination devices are going to go through a pretty big revolution in the way they are developed and managed from a life cycle point of view, because there'll be many, many changes. So I believe that it is complementary in many ways, but 14971 will require it to be a lot more disciplined, a lot more structured in your risk management process. So I hope this helps, but I'm gonna stop the share again and really open up for, for some dialogue. Does this make sense? I don't know who asked me this question, but I wanted to make sure I covered this. Uh, just to address that topic, Naveen, uh, AAMI released a new technical information report, yep. number 105, October 9th, which Good. addresses combination products risk management. I, I was on the development team for that TIR. And um, what it reminds people is that the combination product is a system, and you have to look at both the um, 14971 risk and the Q9 risk, but also the risk of the um, drug on the device or the device on the drug, and also the usage risk, all those things uh, play into the system approach. So um, that's, that's a whole new document that just came out. Uh, it, it looks at it from, from a systematic point of view uh, and you can you can get that one now, uh, and uh, I'm I'm doing a presentation on Friday at Xavier University on that. Oh, we would love to hear more about that. Yes. So, uh, yeah, great, great resource certainly if you are in that area to uh, to check that out. Thank, thank you, Ed. All right. So what is it called again? TIR. It's Amy, it's in the notes here, chat box. Amy TIR one zero five. Technical Information Report 105, released October 9. Thank you, Ed, for sharing that. And, and it also, Naveen, ties into TIR 48, um, which uh, was the original uh, guidance from Amy that was released based on the uh, FDA regulations on uh, combination products. So those two tie together. And there's now discussions uh, with Europe on the MDR and how that applies to combination products between the FDA and the European regulators. So uh, it's an area that's, that's moving rapidly and you need to keep your eye on the ball there. I think this is, you're right, Ed. So there'd be a lot happening in that area. Okay. Uh, I have a few more which were very interesting. So uh, this question was, my question are focused on feedbacks after audit and inspections and also on PMS, post-market surveillance. The objective is to manage medical device risks and its documentation in the best way to be sure we put safety, safe products on the market and we pass any audit or inspection without critical issue. Absolutely. Which are the main points of risk management challenge during audit or inspection? So I'm gonna share with you a few of my experiences and again, open up for, for conversation. So I, I developed in my prior company job a post-market surveillance process from scratch. And I ran that for two years. I managed a cross-functional lead, a team, and I was called into audits all the time. So I was gonna, I'm gonna talk about from a post-market surveillance point of view, what kind of questions may arise? And particularly what people are interested in learning about is how you assess your signals, not trends, but signals. How do you decide when to act and when do you decide not to act? So that could be, a consideration. You need to really think hard about when you will act on signals, what you will do. More importantly, how would you put it back into your design process? Because life cycle management is a closed loop process and we need to be able to demonstrate that. So that's one, one thing I will share. So it starts with complaints. It starts with signal monitoring and processes, all the statistical analysis you do. What is the business process? Second thing really very briefly I will mention on this point is uh, based on my reading of warning letters, is a frequent area of concern around inconsistency of assignment of severities to harms. 
in different documents. If you have a PHA with a severity of certain harm, that severity is inconsistently applied in FMEA or some other document, that's a problem. So many documentation issues, by the way, can be flagged, but that's one big one that you have to be careful about. Last point I want to make is pay attention to the interfaces of risk management with QMS, which is everywhere. So pay attention to complaints management, change control, CAPA, and through those inquiries, it may lead to an inquiry about your risk management process and the foundational strength of the process in terms of its effectiveness. And it can, I've seen that happen, it can lead to all the way to management responsibility through risk management. So, so it can go through many different directions. Uh, I'll open up in just a minute. Uh, let me address the two points later, uh, next in this question. How to justify the balanced benefit risk in the best way that ensures products are safe for patients and users, and that decreases the risk of being unaccepted by any health authority. And I will combine that with the best practices in risk management as part of the same question. My, my suggestion would be keep it simple, make it extremely comprehensive early in the design process. More work you can do early, the better it is. Now, we may not have done that, so make sure your post-market surveillance process is very effective. It's identifying signals quickly before they go out of hand, it's fixing them through the QMS and the process, and it's taking it back to the design. So the, the simpler the process, the more effective it is going to be because expect a lot of churn in that. There is no, what I'm, what I'm reading between the lines in this question is, are there any trade-offs we can make? Safety comes first. You can't say I'm gonna compromise safety. And if you do make decisions which are not favorable to benefit risk, you need to talk about it. Why do you still believe they should go forward? Maybe you are not accurately, in the, not in the right intended uh, use space. Do something, but taking no action, of course, is not acceptable. So uh, the balance is defined by you, what you wanna do. My advice would be keep it simple. So I would just stop share, sharing. And again, I'm sure this is gonna be a rich area of discussion and uh, definitely, uh, if you have heard anything in the audits, don't give me, don't give any proprietary information. Don't say this was the case. But if you have heard something that you would want to share with the group, yeah, please bring it up. What have you seen? You know me, Naveen. I'm going to jump right in. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing, Ed. I appreciate it. There's three things I, I would like to discuss. One is the FDA's QSIT guidance is all the questions that the uh, FDA investigator is supposed to ask when they uh, review your product. So uh, that's a good source of questions. A better source of questions now, which is more up to date than QSIT, which is 1999, um, is the uh, MDSAP uh, audit guidance, which is uh, uh, available for free on the FDA website. Uh, is uh, the M MDSAP audit process. And there's a, that's rich with information. Okay, the next point is that this area, um, you've correctly identified uh, that we need to have a process which monitors information, but ISO 1345 Clause 8 on monitoring and feedback and um, Clause 10 in 14971 uh, were written uh, from the same source document, which is the GHTF Kappa guidance. And that's rich with information. Both of them require now an active process. You can no longer be like the, the Maytag repairman waiting for the phone to ring. You have to be out actively searching information about the performance of your product in the field. Yes. We also align with uh, the MDR's post-market surveillance requirements. Mm -hmm. FDA has now required benefit to risk on their submissions, and there's four guidances the mm -hmm. FDA has on benefit to risk. So um, the uh, uh, clause 7.4.2, I think it is, through 7.4.5 in the technical information report 24971, all addresses benefit to risk and it ends up in the, the 0.5 clause with three examples for you to use. So go there, get that document and look at it because it's rich with information on how to do uh, benefit to risk. By the way, the term benefit 
is not defined in any of the regulations or any of the other standards except for 14971. There's a new definition for the term benefit that's going to give you a lot of help, and it's blown up in yeah. the uh, uh, TIR that I referenced that I mentioned. It talks about it this in depth to help you uh, do that. And I'll shut up now. Great, great uh, resources for, for us to review. Uh, Saurabh has a question. Can you or someone speak to proactive PMS activities? So I, um, I, I don't really like to focus too much on proactive PMS because by the time it's PMS, it's already reactive, okay? Proactive is early in the design phase with PHA and understanding of what can go wrong. So let's not get hung up on the terminology. But I think what Saurabh, you are trying to ask, and again, feel free to jump in, is how do I get on top of it? How do I get to understand what's happening before things get too bad? So I'm getting all these complaints, right? They're coming at it, coming at me from many different directions. That's what I call signal monitoring. So, uh, you know, we monitor signals and we develop methodologies that will help you improve your signal to noise ratio. And I'm talking in general terms. Uh, we can go through some, some examples later on in more detailed discussions. But through information that's coming to you, not just to you, but let's say other places in, in open literature, in open sources, understand what's happening so you can detect from this what kind of signals are popping up, which you should pay attention. Okay, so that's a little bit proactive. It's not, you're still reacting to what's happening in the marketplace, but you're trying to understand what is the general situation and what's a signal, right? So signal is, is important to understand. Not, not every signal is worth taking action on. So you have to figure out what signal, what's noise, and that's some some of the statistical tech methodologies can help you. Pay attention to signal detection. Have rules and uh, action plans. What will be your trigger point? When will you take action? Some of the action could be just pure monitoring. Some of the action could be no. I must go and fix it, right? And uh, in my prior experience, we actually undertook projects that related to customer experience based on signal assessment, not only just safety. And we ran a two year long project, millions of dollars to fix a fundamental problem in our process, which had nothing to do with safety, but it had to do with customer experience. So think about a risk management process that can allow you to see, now I'm not talking 14971 anymore, right? I'm talking about effectiveness and making your executive team understand the benefit of it, that I'm actually gonna help customer experience as well, not by compliance, but because it's good for business. So signal monitoring can help you anyway, in, in many different directions. Uh, can you provide an example or a non -exist, of a non-existing product and determine how you would calculate its POH? So by this question, I'm understanding that the product is not in the market yet, maybe it's in development, maybe it's an innovative idea, I really don't have any information to be able to estimate what is my probability of harm. Uh, it's a very good question and a lot of you might find yourself in this situation. So what I would say is um, even if you have a breakthrough innovative product, the use scenario is you have some information from the market. Explore whatever you can, use whatever you can from a similar environment, use scenario, with an understanding of your specific technology and the intended use. I think you can still do some estimates. Level of confidence might be low, but you will still, you could still have an initial assessment of what is a potential probability of harm of a specific scenario that you are thinking about. So I would say um, this is not an easy thing to pull off in practice. Uh, you may choose to take a conservative approach in the beginning. You may say, Fine. If I don't know anything, I will assume it will happen. Okay. Probability is one. Now what? How would you control it? What could you do to bring it down? Now, so the problem with that approach is you do not leverage potentially some of the options that might be available to you already based on what I call state of the art. So uh, I'm I know I'm talking at a, at a slightly kind of higher level here, but the point I want to make is you can always estimate a POH with less confidence maybe. And if you absolutely cannot assume probability of one and go with severity, that's, that, that's the final recommendation. I would yeah, make. I was going to say just from my own personal experience, th that's a really good question because I've worked on a couple of different really novel devices. I say number one, 
pull in your um, medical users. I mean, if you know, if you have, you know, if it's physicians that you're working with, obviously, if it's customers that are patients, then it's different. But pull in; they will give you some really good ideas of similar use scenarios, and they will be able to give you um, appropriate backing of um, probability of harm. And I would also caution to not actually, instead of what Naveen said to go to, uh, be conservative, I would say, do not go that way because a lot of people, I've been on novel devices where people, everything goes to death. Mm -hmm. And then you're in this scenario in your FEMIAs where you have to try and um, prove and push, you know, these um, occurrences down and um, you're designing all these things based on something that is much too conservative. So I would say to just try to get an appropriate POH is to um, contact your users, which are typically physicians. They'll be able to give you some good indication of what's in the, and of course, anything that's similar that you can find in the mod database, but um, mm -hmm. physicians are helpful. Yep. Guys, I know time flies. Right, we are already at twelve thirty. Oh. Anybody else has any other comments or uh, closing thoughts? But I do have a few things I want to say before we close. So please, please uh, raise your hand, or if you want to share anything in the chat box. A couple of things, Naveen. Uh, since I can't shut up, um, I would mention that that the uh, total product lifecycle database at FDA is very useful. You can put a product code in find out all the events that have happened for that product code, find out all the uh, product uh, submissions that have been approved by, are cleared by FDA, and also all of the recalls that have occurred. And, and that's a, a great source of information to build on uh, Verna's uh, mod database, is a total product lifecycle, which comes from the mod database. Yes. And, um, there, there's just a wealth of information out there. Don't think you don't, you've never seen this before. Uh, also, if a standard identifies a hazard in the standard, um, then the risk is considered unacceptable. There's a risk control measure identified, implement it. Then the, the risk at that point, if it's been implemented uh, and uh, tested according to the standard, the risk becomes acceptable. So the use of standards is, is very valuable in reducing the amount of effort that you have to do on risk management. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. And by the way, I, I really appreciate everything that you said. Okay. So we, we don't want you to shut up. So don't feel like you have to. This is the whole point. Guys, I cannot tell you how, how excited I am with your engagement and participation. I hope it is useful. I would like to send you a very quick survey as a follow-up. Okay, please let me know what you think. My plan is to do these interactive Q and A's on a monthly basis. And this is my way of uh, engaging with you, having a conversation, uh, get to know each other in the industry. Uh, so let me know what works for you. My plan would be to alternate Tuesdays and Thursdays. Like this time it was Tuesday, next time I might do it Thursday. Some people may find that more convenient. So we will do on a monthly basis. My last point here I wanna tell you is, uh, just do that, please, please do that follow-up survey. It's gonna be like only two or three questions, I promise. I'm not gonna ask you too many things. Uh, and then I look forward to seeing you in uh, future Q and A's. Anything else you wanna suggest for improvement? I'm all ears. Uh, so I'm, I'm willing to change everything uh, that is possible because my intent here is to engage with you and have a conversation. So with that, I would really, I want to thank you again and uh, look forward to seeing you in another Q&A.